Okay, good morning, Lakeview. Morning, everyone here and, and online. Today we celebrate our Lord and his triumphal entry. And uh, so let's all stand as we sing together. you've done for us, Lord, that while we were yet sinners, you had that plan to rescue us, that you loved us so much, that you sent your one and only son into the world that we would have life, and we thank you for that, Lord. We pray, Lord, this morning we know it's such an important morning for the life of our church, and we pray, Lord, that um, any influence the enemy would have would be broken and out of the way and lord even our flesh so that lord your spirit would move through this place and have uh, full control lord our desire is to focus primarily on you who you are what you've done and lord how you desire for us to live for you and we praise you. We thank you, Lord, for doing all of that and look forward to it this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, Lakeview. Good morning. It's good to be here today. It's good that um, we have a little bit of snow on the ground, too, just to see the beauty of what God can do in creation. I know it doesn't always feel great, but it is it is beautiful. I was driving through and seeing all the the snow kind of just caked on the trees as I was driving up over the mountain, and I was just like, God, you're so good. Your, your beauty in creation is amazing. Um, we're also looking forward to this the spring and the flowers blooming, and we saw some of that over at the parsonage yesterday, and that was beautiful, too. Um, I want to if you have your bulletin handy, pull it out. There's a lot in there we're going to go through real quickly. Um, and there's, there's two things in there that, that aren't there that I'm going to share with you. So just uh, let's go through kind of the bulletin first. Um, this week, there are a lot of things going on. Even today, after the service, we have a luncheon. We get to uh, spend more time with the Thornton family and just enjoy that fellowship together. I thank you for all the people that have brought food. And if you didn't bring food, there's, there's going to be plenty of it. So please stay. Enjoy that time together. Um, the, there's the birdhouse um, project also planned downstairs. And I think Faye will be able to direct you to 
uh, you know, how to get involved with that if you signed up for that. There is, this is kind of in, in addition to the normal, the normal uh, weekly plan for us on Wednesday. So I want to call this out specifically. Being that um, Pastor, uh, Pastor Thornton is here this week, we want to have a congregational meeting this Wednesday at 6 p.m. We have, we have other things planned, and I know that other folks will be here on Wednesday. So if you're already here on Wednesday and you're planning to be here on Wednesday for something else, we don't want to interfere with that. There is a little bit of a time shift in that we, we would ask everyone to be here to participate in the conversation um, about this, you know, how we move forward as a church and if there's any questions. Um, that's at 6 p.m., so please be here. If you can't be here, I'm not sure if the slide, there's a slide up uh, somewhere in the deck. Of, on If you can't be here on Wednesday at 6 p.m. because you'll be out of town, you already have a plan uh, for something else, if you could contact one of the elders, myself, Jeff, Chad, or Mike, or if you would email the office email address, um, office at lakeviewoligo.com, let us know. We, 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 we want the feedback. We want the discussion. We want to make sure that everyone is heard. So please um, engage one of those ways. Um, on Thursday, we'll, we'll have a silent communion service here at 7 p.m. Uh, so I'm sorry, 6.30, thank you. 6.30 p.m. will be a silent communion here. Um, there'll be a time of reflection. We'll have scripture and, and uh, scripture and prayer time and uh, a time to take communion. Good Friday, on Friday evening at the United Methodist Church in Owego, there's a Good Friday celebration, uh, it's community service. Welcome to please attend that, it's at 7 p.m. And then Sunday we'll be back here again, Easter Sunday. Um, there's a couple other things, specific date things. I wanna, I wanna point out the couple small group is starting um, April 2nd. Chad and Judy uh, would be happy to talk to you about that. Act Dinner is coming up. Um, Wednesday is when we typically like to have uh, all of the supplies in, so if you signed up for that, if you haven't signed up and would like to help with that, there's a sign-up sheet on the back in the, in the corner, and you could do that, and then um, just make sure that everything is in by, the, by April uh, 3rd, which is the, the Wednesday before the 4th, which is the dinner. Um, I know there's a lot. There's a lot of stuff to put on the calendar. This is really important too, though, which is the International Worker Conference. We have a missionary coming from a creative access country. Uh, we identify him as TL. We'll only just say his initials because it's uh, sort of one of, it's a creative access country, meaning he has a creative way to be in the country that he's serving in. Uh, so we don't want to put him in any danger of saying the name. Um, he will be here. Friday night, April 12th at 6.30 p.m. There's a meal, it's a family night, it's kind of an informal gathering. Typically that's when they share, uh, when, when the, the missions worker shares about the type of work they're doing, the people group they're, they're working with, and um, is, is really able to take lots of questions and have a good conversation about what the Lord has been doing in, the, in their life. Saturday, the following morning, there's a men's breakfast at North Waverly Alliance. I believe Dave Jaros is gonna be working out some, like a sign up, maybe a form or some way to communicate how we can carpool over to North Waverly. Uh, so if you have interest in that, if you're a man, man you'd like to be, participate, Dave Jaros, one of the elders, talk to us um, and we'll figure out the carpooling on that. And that morning then at 10 a.m. for the ladies, there is a ladies' brunch, and that is, um, is that here? That's here. There will be a ladies' brunch. So the wife, TL's wife, will be coming here. We'll be going to North Waverly. His wife will be coming here for a brunch for the, with the ladies. Uh, so please sign up on the back table. There's a sign up back there um, to, be, to participate with that. That evening on Saturday, um, he will be then speaking over in candor, and we are we're invited and welcome to participate 
over at Cander. And uh, again, I think maybe transportation, we're trying to figure out how to get folks to and from Lakeview to Cander. Um, don't know, Dave, give me a sign. Is there a sign up for that or we, we've kind of, not yet, okay. And then after the service on the 14th, we'll have an international uh, workers dinner. So right after the service, there will be another meal and a br bring a dish to pass at that meal. And we just will enjoy the fellowship with the international worker that day. Um, I'm not gonna read everything verbatim. There's two more things and I, I'm gonna add them, try to add them quickly. April 13th, that same day that there is a men's breakfast, women's brunch, and um, evening service over at Cander, Melissa has been planning um, a prayer event to pray at the Capitol in Albany. And if you feel led to that, we want you to be involved with that. Um, not, not to diminish anything else that is going on here. If, you, if the Lord says missions, let's you know, engage with that. Please do that. But if your heart feels like you need to participate in a prayer event where you drive to Albany, there's a gathering there. She's been planning that. Um, uh, please see her, see Melissa. She'll give you all the information you need to know about that. Last thing, um, I ask for your prayers because myself, Kelly Murtha, and two other individuals from um, Appalachian will be headed to Spain at the beginning, at the end of April, beginning of May, to assist with what's called the Field Forum, where missionaries from Spain and Portugal gather together for kind of like a, a fellowship time, a general council, if you will, maybe more like a national regional thing. And we're going to go and help out with the teens of the families, the, these missions families that all gather together. We're gonna be helping support um, the missions, uh, the, the teen work there and the, the children's work. So please pray for us. We, we desire your prayers. We know that it only happens because our body is praying. So um, if you have questions about that and would be encouraged by hearing more about that, I'd be happy to share that too. Um, yeah, that's all I've got. <laughs> I know it's been a long one. Thank you. Let's continue to worship. You know, the time we're celebrating here is when Jesus came into the Jerusalem on a donkey and the Pharisees said, uh, tell your followers to be quiet. And Jesus said, if they do, even the rocks will cry out. So Lord, today we um, join together with all of your creation to give you praise, the giver of all life. You give us every breath, even that breath that we breathe. And if you're here and you're in a dark place, know that he is the light if you have a broken heart. Relationships that need restoring, he is your hope. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the dark. Every heart that is broken, and great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we. Oh, no. 
Oh, s i 
morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verses 1 through 18. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was the one Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha was serving them, and Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of perfume, pure and expensive, Nard anointed Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. So the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Then one of his disciples, Judah Iscariot, who was about to betray him, said, Why wasn't the perfume sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He was in charge of the money bag and would steal part of it, part of what was put in it. Jesus answered, leave her alone. She has kept it for the day of my burial. For you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. They had come to the festival, heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him. They kept shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. Just as it is written, do not be afraid, daughter Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. However, when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Meanwhile, the crowd which had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify. This is also why the crowd met him, because they heard he he had done this sign. Stay here, stay here, Mike. It's only a quick one. Uh, Of course, uh, access is staying upstairs today, but only pre-K, if you would, can go upstairs to the nursery, all right? Only pre-K, and that way everybody else can stay and uh, hear from the new pastor, okay? Thank you. You stole my thunder. I was going to make that. <laughs> Tease it. No. Oh, we're so excited um, to have Matthew Thornton with us and his family today. And uh, we... Um, and with the elders, we were able to spend quite a bit of time with them yesterday, and uh, we're looking forward to having him share with you and uh, you understanding more of uh, who he is. Uh, he and his wife um, are really from, I didn't, 
I guess, make that real clear uh, last week, but uh, that they're from the upper New York area here, and uh, they're currently living in Ohio, but um, their roots are, are more up in New York. Uh, and so we just invite you, and we're looking forward to what God has for us from here. Thank you. I, uh, I heard a comment already that I'm tall. <laughs> and uh, it was funny, I met, um, well, I'm super excited to be here and to uh, see all of you and to meet all of you as well. Um, I, uh, on the video, it was funny, and we did a Zoom uh, call and interview, and um, actually one of the shorter ones I thought on the video was Steve. <laughs> and, <laughs> so <laughs> it's a little bit different on the video than it is um, when it's here. And another thing I have to say before I start is, is I almost, I never do this. I don't uh, teach or preach off of my phone. But the thing is, is that um, the more I kind of prayed about what was uh, going on in, in these scriptures, and I really think what uh, God wanted to say, so I just kept jotting down notes more and more and more that was edited on my phone. So um, I actually almost never do that. So... Uh, let's pray together. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for these people. Thank you for this church. Lord, I just ask that your uh, Holy Spirit would move through this place. You would open our hearts and minds to understand what you're saying today, that you would plant these words in our hearts, that you would grow them, and that you would bring an abundant harvest. And um, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So today, uh, Christians across the world celebrate Palm Sunday. And this is to remember the account in scriptures that record Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem, and which many had hoped would be the deliverance from a foreign oppression by the Romans. And Jesus was hoped to be a military conqueror. However, he brought and ushered in a deliverance of something so much more real, uh, a deliverance from sin and darkness uh, from this world of the unseen spiritual world. While Jesus was mistaken by many for the kind of deliverer he would be, we know today that Jesus can deliver us from, yes, sin and death, but also from physical circumstances and things that threaten us in the physical world as well. The Old Testament differs from the New in that God was delivering people uh, from physical circumstances Stories that we remember from the Old Testament, like slavery in Egypt and hunger and thirst in the desert. In the New Testament, we see that God also delivers from slavery to sin and satisfies our hunger and thirst for righteousness and truth in the spiritual desert of this world. Would you agree that a lot of times this world is like a spiritual desert? And depending on where you live and which region of the nation or which region of the state can be like a spiritual desert. God never changed, however, and never ceased being God. The God who delivered from physical threats in the Old Testament still delivers from physical threats today. He is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And that's Hebrews 13, 8. So while we celebrate Palm Sunday today, I want us to see that Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem paints a picture of celebration and hope. The entire nation of Israel was oppressed by the Roman Empire and foreign domination and longed to be free and self-determined under God. When Jesus came to Jerusalem, he was greeted with palm branches laid down uh, so, that he would not, so that he would be honored and he wouldn't have to walk on the common ground. Jesus is certainly not common. And we shouldn't treat him like he's common. So Jesus is extremely uncommon. And we need to know and have an expectancy, an expectant attitude that Jesus is uncommon. We need to celebrate his presence. If you lack 
hope in your life, maybe we began to treat Jesus like he's common. Maybe he's just like every other guy, but he's not. He is God. There was truly an attitude of expectancy and hope that Jesus brought with him. That's the same hope that Jesus offers us today. So let's take a look at some of the context that surrounds John chapter 12, 1 through 18. And just a little bit of background here. John 12 invites us into an intimate communion with Jesus as he approaches the cross. It depicts acts of love, moments of divine glory, the fulfillment of prophecies, and the somber reality of unbelief. The chapter is stirring reminder of Jesus' sacrificial love, the glory of his mission, and his role as our Savior, urging us to walk in the light of his truth. So what's happening in verses 1 through 8 is Mary anoints Jesus' feet with an expensive perfume and wipes them with her hair. And Judas objects, and he's citing that the value of the perfume could be given to the poor. And Jesus defends Mary, hinting at his impending death and burial. As we go on into verses 9 through 19, a large crowd gathers desiring to see Jesus and the resurrected Lazarus. Jesus enters Jerusalem on a young donkey, and he fulfills a prophecy of Zechariah while the crowd hails him as king. So what I want us to see today is that the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem paints a picture of celebration of his presence and hope. And we discussed that the Israelite nation had been under the oppression of of the Roman Empire, and the Jews were seeking a deliverer, although they thought it would be a, a military conqueror. They thought, this is going to liberate us from the Romans and foreign control, but he brought something very different. Palm Sunday reminds us to celebrate the hope and the freedom that Jesus brings. We need to celebrate as it is the celebration of Jesus' presence in our lives that brings our deliverance. And I'm wondering today, are there people who are trying to get free of something that just seems like they can't get free of something? Do you want to be healed? And do you want to see God move powerfully in your life? Everyone suffers different trials. The Bible says that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. So no one is going to escape suffering, but this does not change that Jesus is our high priest interceding for us before the Father, and he is our deliverance. Is Jesus your deliverer? How much do you celebrate Jesus' presence in your life. So there's a very strong connection between celebrating Jesus' presence and deliverance. So we need to celebrate who he is. He is deliverer. He is God. He is healer. He is purifier. He is sanctifier. He is holy. He is just. He is loving. He is merciful. This list could go on and on and on. Jesus is to be celebrated and welcomed into our lives like he was celebrated and welcomed into Jerusalem. We need to realize just how desperate we are for God to move in our lives and to celebrate Jesus' presence out of that place of desperation because the world teaches us that desperation is wrong, and it's not. Desperation for God is the best place that you can be desperation for something that only God can do and only God can heal is the right place to be. So desperation lies within all of us, even if we don't sense the need for it. It doesn't mean that it's not there. So would you agree this morning that there's probably something in your life that you desperately need God for? 
And would you agree that there are times that we look to other things to solve that need? We start looking here, we start looking there, we start looking here. Well, I got to call this person. Well, I got to talk to this doctor. Well, I got to talk to my finance manager. Go to God first. Desperation can be a good thing. So let's take a look on what's going on in some of these verses. And it's important to understand the context of what's happening at the same time around the main passage that we will focus on for Palm Sunday. So we're going to go back into verse 5. So you're in John 12, verse 5. When Mary had taken the expensive perfume and used it to anoint Jesus' feet, Judas objected. And basically, Judas is saying, Judas is saying, you know, why didn't you, why did you waste this perfume on Jesus? Why wasn't it given to the poor? You could have sold it and taken all this money and given to the poor. Jesus says, leave her alone. It was intended she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You'll always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. So basically, Jesus is saying here, it's astounding. It flies in the face of all reason, and really in the face of the attitudes of many people, Christian and non-Christian alike, that we look at the resources that we have and we decide how best to logically use them. Does it make any sense for Mary to anoint Jesus' feet and use up such a great amount of expensive perfume? Well, it certainly doesn't in the eyes of Judas. And Judas, despite... So Jesus is incarnate at this point, right? He is God in the flesh. And he's with God in the flesh. And Judas cannot grasp what Jesus is talking about. Jesus calls us to a celebration of his presence, and it doesn't always make sense in this world. So Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, it's familiar to, to all of us, I'm sure. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. So in Judah's mind, what the perfume was worth would have been sold for much greater and really been used, um, for many would say, as a good purpose to benefit the poor. But we also know that Judas' intentions were not pure. And it was Judas that Satan entered into to betray Jesus. So nonetheless, we have an example of worldly thinking apart from the guidance of God. So where is our thinking with celebrating the presence of Jesus in ways that don't make sense? What are our limits? Jesus calls us to celebrate his presence in ways that don't make sense. The pious or the religious in us seeks to look to our own understanding and what we can see right in front of us. The spiritual world is nothing of what we can see. And Jesus says Mary did the right thing. They would always have the poor, but they wouldn't always have Jesus. Jesus is saying, place all of your love and your affection on me, and I will take care of the rest. So that's a place of extreme humility on the part of a believer all of your love and your affection placed on Jesus and expecting him to work out everything else in your life, it's not that we don't love and care for the poor. It's that primarily our love needs to be placed on Jesus Christ. It's only then by celebrating his presence that he fills our hearts with joy and love. And out of that, we find ourselves compelled in loving obedience by the, uh, to the example of Jesus, the greatest servant to serve others, including the poor in our lives. That's not accomplished the other way around. We don't love the poor first. We love Jesus first and foremost. And this is the only truly way to effectively love and serve others. Jesus said in 
Matthew 22, 37 through 39, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. That's the first thing. And the second is like this, love your neighbor as yourself. So this also points to two realities of which one is far greater. The spiritual world, a heavenly reality, is far outlast the test of time, and it is the ultimate reality. But then there's what we call reality. We call what we can see and touch and feel reality, and yet it's not. The spiritual world is far more real than this world. This world will pass away, but the spiritual world will remain and is eternal. Here's a few scriptures. Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 1 John 2, 16 through 18, the world and its desires will pass away, but whoever does the will of God will live forever. In the revelation of John 6, 14, the heavens recede like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. So the spiritual world is far more real than the temporal. Right? So Jesus calls us to celebrate his presence and thereby celebrate eternal realities that will last forever instead of the temporal realities, which will be exhausted we must and are called to celebrate his presence and pour out our love lavishly on him. It is important to note that Mary seemed unconcerned what anyone else thought of her. Does it say that Mary was kind of unsure about what to do? Or, you know, she was, well, this one's going to think that I'm odd or this doesn't look right and I'm nervous about... It doesn't say any of that, does it? So this is the same way that we need to be in our lives. When celebrating Jesus' presence, we need to be unconcerned about what others think of us and how our love for Jesus looks or what it costs us. It simply doesn't matter. And when you can live in a place where it just doesn't matter to you that your love for Jesus might not be someone else's cup of tea, you have found freedom. So you can love the Lord and do as you please. And it doesn't matter what so-and-so thinks about it or what so-and-so thinks about it. When your love is poured out lavishly on Jesus, that's freedom. So it doesn't say that Mary thought long and hard about how to use the perfume or that she just kind of weighed her, you know, how much will this cost me? She just acted in love towards Jesus. And I wonder how much we consider in our own lives, what is the cost of loving Jesus and what will it cost me? How much money? How much time? What will it look like or how will things work out? This is not celebrating his presence. Celebrating his presence should be a selfless and giving act. Love God's way doesn't consider the cost to himself. God always acts on behalf of and for the benefit of the other person. So John 3.16 teaches us God so loved the world it doesn't speak of him counting the cost and weighing it out very carefully. God acted radically in love on behalf of a world that did not love him. And this is the same love that we are called to. Do we act in radical ways towards people who don't love us? That, that's the example that is set. We want to be more like Jesus but we don't want to love the people who have hurt us. I recently, um, I've had experiences, in, I've had to learn not just to forgive people, but to love them. So you can forgive someone I mean, without really loving them, <laughs> right? You can, well, I'm going to forgive you, and I'm, uh, I don't know about this loving thing, right? You can do that, but there was a morning where I woke up a couple months ago, and God said to me, clear as a bell, he said, Jesus loved the people who killed him. And I knew right away. What God was really saying to me is, you 
me to love people who have hurt you severely. Not just forgive them. I had done that. The forgiveness part actually didn't come hard for me. I mean, that's something that God has grown me a lot in, in, in recent years, that forgiveness part was actually easy. But then God's telling me, you actually need to go and love that person. And I'm like, I really don't think so. <laughs> I'm not sure if you understand, God, what's happening here. No, he knows. <laughs> but I'm just saying, he made that so clear to me. I'm like, oh. I used to think forgiveness was the big deal. Well, it is a big deal. But can you move from the hurt to forgiveness to loving those people? That was the challenge that God gave me. But loving people, not just forgiving them, that's the only way to freedom. You will never be free. If you can forgive them, great. But can you love them on top of that? So didn't Jesus pose the question that if we only love those who love us, that we're no better than the world? So if we look down in verse 9, Meanwhile, a large crowd um, of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. Here we see large crowds come to see Jesus as a result of raising Lazarus from the dead. People are attracted to miracles. Miracles point to a divine force, not an earthly thing. So when life and heart is, is hard and difficult, and there's no answer to anything, you find yourself in what I call miracle mode. You don't need a miracle if something else can satisfy. Miracles are experienced when there is no other answer. So not having another answer is an excellent place to be. God is never short on miracles, and he never runs out of them. So when Jesus is celebrated, miracles happen by his power according to his will. And wherever Jesus' presence is, the miraculous becomes possible. We should expect and hope that being in the presence of Christ, that miracles will happen. And it's difficult in our modern world to be so desperate for Jesus' presence that, the mirac that we need the miraculous power that he brings. We want to solve things on our own, and we want a pill to take to cover up the symptom. We want a quick fix. We want more money in the bank, and we want the easy way out. But none of these things require the miraculous power of Jesus' presence. You will find places in the world where there are little resources, little money, little medicine, that miracles happen in a much greater degree. And this is because when you lack you need the presence of Jesus so much more. The key is, how do we stay desperate for the presence of God despite so many resources in our lives that could solve the problem? And here we have another example of celebrating Jesus' presence. People were coming to him. In a way, people were celebrating the presence of Jesus because they just had to be where Jesus was. And is that us today? Do we just flock to where Jesus is, what he's doing in our lives, or what we sense he's leading us towards? Are we so drawn to celebrating the presence of Jesus that we call up everybody we know, and we're like, you've got to get over here because something amazing is happening? Is that us? And this comes from, do we need the miraculous? Do we need it? something beyond what we can touch and see and feel. And this is something I uh, discussed with Mike last night, and there's two things here before we continue. One, I'm long-winded, so I hope you're comfortable. And I, because it's, <laughs> I, I, last night, um, the, um, the elders mentioned to me about, um, they said, well, you know, sometimes, you know, if the, if the message is a little bit too short, we would like more, this or that. And I said, I gotcha. So we're, I've got, a, I've got a lot to say, but I really do think that it is something that is meaningful. And I think it's, it's the power of God's word, and it's transformational, and it's worth it. So that's good. 
So um, that being said, um, Mike also let me know that I'm not sure, I think some of you um, know a little bit about me and my story, but I'll share, I'll try to make it brief before we continue because there's, there's a lot more. <laughs> um, so um, I am the person that um, this church and the whole CNA district and churches around the planet were praying for. Um, I was the person who, Melanie's from the district, I was the person who in 2021, you started getting updates from Melanie in the district who um, I got COVID and I got uh, three separate strains of pneumonia simultaneously. Um, I was hospitalized, paralyzed, head to toe on life support for seven weeks, uh, 52 days. I was uh, paralyzed head to toe in a medically induced coma. Um, I lost the ability to do everything, sit, speak, swallow, eat, drink, talk, etc. Um, I was I was put beyond the point of death seven different times and the Lord rescued me out of that. And I cannot thank, I don't say that people are a part of my life, but if you prayed for me and if you remember this story, I am that person. And um, I'm not a person who knows the miraculous. I am the miracle. Because St. Joseph's of Syracuse cannot explain why I survived or why I'm alive. And I know why I'm alive. And I know that I, I had complete respiratory failure. I was oxygenating at 25%, 18% when you're supposed to be 92 or above. So I was rescued out of that. I have learned how to do everything that I can do now all over again. It's just like a baby learns growing up. Um, I was able to start snowmobiling again a month after I got home from the hospital, um, which was a miracle. I completed a master's degree while I was recovering. And I, in eight months, I was able to go back to work full time while doing a doctorate full time in less than half the time that it takes normally. So I say that not as a testimony to me. I want to be very clear about that. I say that as a testimony to what God can do. So if you prayed for me, I say that you are not a part of, I say you're not in my life. You're now a part of me because I would not be alive if it wasn't for your prayers. So I am truly thankful and um, deeply thankful for any person who prayed for me, we had, we had churches, like people from the Philippines are like writing us, I'm praying for you. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's wild and how fast the word spread and how many people prayed for me. Um, and when you, you know, this the story of Lazarus is quite powerful to me because I'm a near Lazarus story. Um, there was no hope, but God stepped in. And God rescued me. And so I also, I've shared this with a few churches, and I shared it at district conference as well, that um, if God can do that for me, there's no favoritism with God. So if God can do this for me, what can he do for you? There is no favoritism. God lifted me practically out of the grave. And he can do whatever needs to be done in your life he can do it. So I just wanted to share that briefly and uh, thank you that, yes, that um, that was me. And I'm so, I, I thank you. Um, let's go on. I do apologize again. I mean, long-winded. I'm roughly, roughly halfway through. So let's keep going here. Um, <laughs> um, so the chief priests, we're in verse 10. Chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. So the celebration of Jesus' presence did not go over well with the Pharisees and the priests. Jesus' miracles and teaching were drawing people away from them. So what did they do? They made a plan not only to kill Jesus, now like, let's kill Lazarus too. Well, you could say it was a plan to kill the miraculous. So think about that for a minute. Why? Why? Would you want to kill off 
the miraculous. Yet we can, um, so we can kill off the need for the miraculous when we're always satisfying every life problem with our own power and what we think we can do. The, and, and, and I will say, I laid in that hospital bed for so long where I couldn't even move a finger and I became nothing before God. And if you become nothing before God, he becomes everything. And there's just no, there's no words and there's no way to really get that experience. It had to be walked out with Jesus. I said to the elders last night, I said, I'm not a fan of that part of the Bible that says we know Christ through our suffering. I'm like, that is not my favorite part of the Bible, okay? Don't like it. It's true. Don't like it. But the suffering to go through, to know Jesus that deeply, I can say it's worth it because I know him in a way that I never would have known. So in your life, when there's suffering, you do have to accept it. And you, <laughs> you will know him so deeply in your suffering in a way that you could never know him any other way. So I won't say it's fun. I'll say it's worth it. <laughs> it's worth it. So um, uh, going on here. So um, celebrating the presence of Jesus doesn't come without a cost. And we need to be prepared for that in our own lives. Celebrating the presence of Jesus will infuriate and it will anger people who are have authority or who are in power over us. But it even could be done with the best intent. But following and celebrating Jesus' presence may not always sit well with others. And so we need to ask ourselves, is Jesus worth the cost? So points from these verses also connect to the triumphal entry into Jerusalem where we see yet another celebration of his presence. And what's very interesting here is that a lot of lambs would have had to have been brought into Jerusalem at this time because it was one of the greatest holidays of Judaism. It was Passover. And many of them came from Galilee and brought all these lambs with them because we found in Exodus that um, lambs had to stay with the family for at least three days before they were sacrificed. Okay? So it's very possible that as Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, there could have been a lot of lambs coming into Jerusalem at the same time, and Jesus is the lamb of God. He is the greatest lamb. But I, ju I just found that fascinating just to help visualize what's going on, and he's entering into Jerusalem. There is a Jewish historian, uh, his name was uh, Josephus. He estimated that at that time there are records of over 256,000 lambs being brought into Jerusalem at that time. And Jesus, being in the midst of that, being the greatest lamb, the lamb of God. The palm branches are also very fascinating because they're a symbol of Jewish nationalism. And we talked about was Jesus going to be a a military conqueror, a, a deliverer, right? So these palm branches are a symbol of Jewish nationalism. They were also found on um, they were also found on coins that were made, um, AD 66 uh, through 70. So palms were representative also of royalty in the ancient world, and the fact that they were being laid down for Jesus and this donkey to walk on showed just how highly anticipated and honored Jesus' entry into Jerusalem really was. So when we look at Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So this word here in Greek, because the New Testament was written in Greek. So, so when it was written, this word Hosanna, it means save us now. It doesn't just mean save us. It means save us now. And the end of that, the na, hosanna, the na, is, excuse me, that expresses an intense emotion. So the crowd that gathered to welcome Jesus into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, and they're shouting, hosanna, hosanna, hosanna in the highest. They're shouting this. They looked to Jesus with a great hope. He is going to be our deliverer, 
all right? But they're shouting this Hosanna. It doesn't just mean save us. It means save us now. Save us now. There's an urgency. So I'm asking, do we approach Jesus this way? Save us now. Save us now. And that is not just salvation when we die. The frozen chosen. Okay? It's not just that. Is Jesus somehow limited in his power that he can't save you now from something? Is he limited? He's not limited. So do we cry out with this same intensity to Jesus, with that na, hosa, na, that intense emotion? Do we cry out to Jesus that way that we need to be saved now? Do we have that urgency for Jesus? Or are we willing to accept, well, this is oppressing me, like the Romans. This is oppressing me in my life. This is oppressing me in my life. This is oppressing me. If we sit there and accept those things and don't cry out for deliverance from those things, we are letting something foreign dominate us. Just like the Romans being a foreign power dominating the Israelites. So the crying out that's recorded in the Greek is kravgadzo, and it means to cry out with a loud screaming or shrieking, especially an inarticulate or unintelligible sounds, but the focus is the reason why, the moral or spiritual reason why you're crying out. What this points out to when they're crying out, Hosanna, and they're waving these palm branches and laying them down, what this points to is that there was something much deeper, a desperation driving the crying out to Jesus. He was cried out to with little dignity or concern over how they might have looked. But it was a cry from the heart and a cry from the soul. So that Greek word that I just shared with you there, I'm just reading you the definition there is what I'm doing. I'm reading you about what, why that word was used. Greek is a very accurate language where in the English, when the translations are done, um, the English words don't always really get to what the Greek was saying. Some of them do a better job than others, but that's why you go back and you study the Greek and the Hebrew. So Jesus was cried out to on Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry in Jerusalem, not with a being very proper the way that we might imagine being before a king, no, Jesus gave so much hope, and he had so much power, and he had raised Lazarus from the dead. There was something uncontrollable about the way that people greeted and cried out to Jesus to save them now. Now. This is a celebration of the presence of Jesus. It appears it was quite undignified. It was quite a raw expression of praise and excitement the people were unconcerned because they wanted liberation. So my question is, how concerned are we about how we might look in our love for the Lord, in our celebration of his presence, of his coming into our lives? So there's other examples of how, you know, how to cry out from a much deeper place within ourselves. If you see in Romans 8, 26 through 27, it tells us the Holy Spirit will intercede for us when we don't know what to pray or how to pray. And there's so many fascinating things in here uh, um, about how this was written in the Greek. It says the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Okay, So when the Spirit helps us in our weakness, in Greek this means it supplies the help that exactly corresponds to the need. That's the Greek definition. So it's a partnership that exists between the Holy Spirit using your mouth to pray to God. And if there is anyone in here who is unsure about the leading of submitting to the leading of the Holy Spirit when you're praying, is there someone better who can pray to God for you? better than the Holy Spirit working through you to lift up to God what concerns need to be lifted up to God. Is there someone who can do it better? So God knows 
exactly what you need. He, the Holy Spirit, will use your mouth to pray. So and pray doesn't always need to be with exact words because here it says that we will have inexpressible groanings is what it says in Romans 8, 26 through 27. This definition um, in, in Greek, stenagmos, is a groaning or sighing, but it's brought on by great pressure. So great pressure can cause someone to not know how to pray. But that definition says it's brought on by great pressure. That's why we rely on the power of the Holy Spirit to intercede for us and use our mouth and pray. Okay? So a celebration of Jesus' presence, the hope that he brings in the triumphant entry, Jesus challenged so much of the existing order. When they shouted, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, this word is fascinating as well in Greek. The name, this word name, onoma, this is the manifestation or revelation of someone's character. It distinguishes them from all others. So if you pray in the name of Christ, it means to pray as directed or authorized by him, bringing revelation that flows out of being in his presence. So it's not just, well, if I use Jesus' name, I get what I want, right? It's not that. In Hebrew, a name is inseparable from the person. It is their essence. It's who they are. So Jesus' presence was celebrated, and we know that his name is the only name by which we can be saved. But what happens is when you pray in the name of Jesus, it makes the will of God manifest. What's manifest? It means to be observed by the senses, but primarily sight. So when you pray in the name of Jesus, and I, I want you to understand this, it's super important. When you use the name of Jesus, God's will becomes visible in your life. Do you see what that means? That name is the revelation of what it is like to be in the presence of God. So we know that Jesus' name contains immense power. And I, I wrote in my notes here, I said, that doesn't mean, so if it is God's will that you pray in Jesus' name that you're a millionaire tomorrow, if it is God's will, have at it. If it is God's will for you to get an answer to a small prayer, it is the name of Jesus that reveals what it is like to be in the presence of God himself. So Hebrews 4, 16, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We get the revelation of what it's like to be in his presence, and this will inspire us to celebrate the presence of Jesus even more. Celebrate the presence of Jesus not just today on Palm Sunday, but every day throughout the year. Know that when you pray in Jesus' name, you're praying with a name that will reveal what it's like to be in the presence of God and that God's will will be made manifest. You'll be able to see God working in your life. That's what that word means, the name, onoma. And it's so powerful. See, we're taught to do it. You know, we say grace before meal. And in Jesus' name we pray. Do we really know what we're doing? There is so much power in using that name. Now, you can pray for whatever you want. <laughs> God's will becomes manifest, not your will. <laughs> and you know what? The great thing is when we can learn to love God's will, which is always better than ours, if you can learn to love God's will and then you pray in Jesus' name, you know what? You'll see it happening all the time. When you love God's will and you want God's will 
and you agree with God's will and you pray in Jesus' name, you will start seeing it everywhere in your life. You can pray for what you want. <laughs> you can pray for it all you want to. But if it is God's will, it will be made manifest through the name. So that's, that's powerful. That's some amazing things there that are revealed in the scriptures. So an encouragement, be unconcerned about what your praise to Jesus looks like. Don't worry about what somebody else thinks about how you love Jesus. Love Jesus with all your heart and do as you please. It doesn't say to be concerned about what others think about it, really. Cry to him from the heart and soul. Find the desperate place within yourself and pray to him from that desperation. Expect and be prepared for God to move powerfully in your life. He is Hosanna in the highest, and you need him to save you now. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for these people. I thank you for your word. Lord, I ask that, um, I ask that these things would be planted in hearts. I ask that you would grow an abundant, uh, abundance of fruit in our lives from these things. I ask that, uh, that we will know what we're doing praying in Jesus' name, that your will becomes visible, your will becomes real in our lives. And um, I just ask that we can walk with you more and more each day and that we will seek you, that we will make room in our lives to be desperate, to find the desperation within ourselves, and we will pray from that place and that we will cry out to you unconcerned about what it may look like because it's our heart connecting to yours. I just ask all of these things in the name of your son. Amen. pray that this will be a chance for us to consider and ask for the Lord to, to come in, right? We welcome you here, Lord Jesus, because in these uncertain days, we know that he is the one who saves us. So we look forward to, um, and even now, for that hope to be stirring, for hearts to be yearning and turning to him. Let's all stand as we sing. Cause 
when we see you, we find strength to face the day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away. Washed away. Hosanna. Hosanna. You are the God who saves us. You're worthy of all our praises. Hosanna. Hosanna. Come have your way among us. We welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Because when we see you, we find strength to face the day and in your presence all our fears are washed away because when we see you we find strength to face the day and in your presence all our fears are washed away washed away
my living home. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope, alleluia, praise the one who set me free, alleluia, death has lost its grip on me, you have broken every chain, there's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living Jesus Christ, my living hope, oh God, you are my living hope. I didn't know I was supposed to keep on, I forgot, sorry. <laughs> So I just want to thank you for having us here, and we're looking forward to uh, meeting as many of you as we can um, and sharing uh, lunch together. And uh, can, we, can we pray for that now? Oh, we can get to the food, right? So we can, we can. <laughs> that's that's a Melanie's family thing. See, my family my family sits around for a long time and eats like crackers and pepperoni and cheese and stuff while you're really starving and you're like waiting for the food. Her family, if they say come over at 12, you're eating at 12. It's like that's when it starts. So we can pray for the food. And I, I just, I thank you for having us here because I won't be able to talk to every single one of you individually, but I do, I do thank you. And um, yeah, just giving us this opportunity to to meet you and to, to hear what um, God has laid on, on my heart for Palm Sunday. So um, let's pray together and we'll pray for the food as well. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. I just pray that you would bless each and every one of these people. Lord, give us all an attitude of expectancy. Help us to realize that whether we realize we're desperate or not, we are desperate. And um, help us to find that place within ourselves um, that will cry out to you, saying, Jesus, save us now. Um, we need you, Lord. So we're asking that you would bless our time of fellowship and um, bless the food. And, and thank you to all the people who helped put that together. And we're asking that as we go out into the world that you will um, use us as walking billboards um, that we may display to others um, our love for Jesus Christ and that we reflect that to the world around us. And we ask it in your son's name. Amen.